So, hello. Um, today we're going to be looking at a random uh, algebra ISL question. Um, I've seen the problem statement, but I haven't done anything about it, or and I haven't seen like any solutions ideas. So it's like mostly going to be about uh, the solving process, I suppose. So, with that said, let's get into digging into this question. So. Let's first take a look. Um, x minus one times x minus two up to x minus two and 16 is, is the same on the left and on the right. It's written on the board with 2016 linear factors on each side. What is the least possible value of k for which it's possible to erase exactly k of these 4,032 linear factors so that at least one factor remains on each side and the resulting equation has no real solutions. So questions that ask for like, what's the least possible value of k? Um, it's kind of more of a combinatorics thing to ask for what the least value of k is, because first you're going to have to figure out a construction for k, and then you're going to need to do a proof that it's minimal. Um, uh, the proof that it's minimal will probably be more algebra related, but the fact that we need to find a k in the first place is kind of combinatorics. So um, there's always nuance to like the actual subject a, a problem is in. But since this is sort of like a, a combinatorical condition, we're going to have to do techniques um, to solve combinatorics questions um, to like solve this question. And the most basic one is when it asks for what the least value of a number is such that something something is true, um, you're always going to want to test random k to actually figure out what the answer is. Because once you have the answer, that's like a big part of solving the question because then you actually know what you need to prove. So we can immediately try experimenting or we can do small cases. So um, we can do small cases first, but it could be a bit slower. So first I'm gonna take a look at what if we just experiment with the, with the original equation. If it doesn't go well, then I might start with small cases and see if I can see any patterns. So first um, let's think like we can erase K it can be different number of factors we erase on the left and the right side. And we want the resulting equation to have no real solutions. In other words, the two, uh, the two graphs of the equations don't intersect each other. So what that means is, um, okay, so we're gonna have a few interesting facts. We can't have, so, okay, the leading coefficient is always positive for both equations, no matter how many things we erase. So on the right side, they're both going to approach infinity. Let's say their degrees are different. One has a higher degree than the other one. So as they approach infinity, the one with the higher degree is bigger. Then um, if, it, if, they're both, if they're both odd, then as they approach negative infinity, the one with the higher degree is going to be smaller. So that would imply a crossing. So... Uh, it can't be the case that both equations are odd um, or have odd degree. And then let's see what else we can tell. Um, the one with the higher degree could be even, in which case there could be no solutions. Uh, but the one with the lower degree can't be even when the one with the higher degree is odd because it's what happened, but it's also possible for them to both be even. So we're not getting too much information here. It looks like there's a bunch of cases that you could be in. We're not really reducing the question at all. So let's return from this argument. Um, what else can we see? So something important is we're going to know that they have zeros at the points involved in the question. So uh, like, let's say this polynomial right now, without removing any factors, has zeros at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 2016. And the other polynomial also has these factors, 1 to 2 and 16. So now we make an obvious observation, which is that um, they can't share a factor. Like if this one has x minus k, it has a root at k, and this one has a root at k, they're going to intersect at k, right? So that means we need to erase at least 2016 of these numbers because we can't have a shared factor on both sides. The factor is either on one side or the other. So now we can rephrase the question a little bit. Um, by saying like some subset of 
the numbers 1, 2, then 16 are roots of this polynomial and the other subset are roots of this polynomial, then when is how many, what's the maximum amount of terms we can have if the resulting equation has no real solutions? So I guess the first thing, the first thing that comes to mind is what if we just try to construct a solution? So for example, we can take the first 1,008 values and then the later 1,008 values. What's stopping us from just making a polynomial? Mm, well, it would have to be even, which is a bit sketch. But what's stopping us from making a polynomial where this is, has 1,007 values and then um, the one on the left passes through 1,008 values and the one on the right passes through 1,007 values and goes below so they don't intersect. Um, if the polynomials could be scaled arbitrarily, uh, this argument would probably actually work, but we need that the polynomials are monic. So there might be some weird bounding things happening here. So let's take a look actually. Um, it's not too obvious for sure. Um, if they were both even, this obviously fails because uh, this one, yeah, this one would have to increase this way and this one would have to increase this way. Uh, but one is odd, so this might happen. So it's hard really to judge. But right now, okay, the intuition why I chose this set as zeros and this set as zeros for the other function is because it just seems weird if the zeros, like the set of zeros intersect. Like, let's take a look if the zeros of one function, the set of zeros of one function intersect the set of zeros of the other function, because it feels like the, inter the functions would have to be intertwined. Um, if functions don't have any intersections, they have to be completely apart, right? So let's say this is function A having two zeros, and this is function B having another two zeros. We can see actually that um, they must intersect at some point if they're faced like this. If B was like this, they also must intersect. If A was faced like this, it doesn't really matter. It, it always intersects. Um, now, is this true? Like, how would we be able to prove this if, if the set A and the set B were intertwined, that um, they would have to have an intersection? Well, Uh, let's think about this for a moment. Mm. This is A, this is B, this is A, this is B. Like, how would we draw it if they didn't have an intersection? We would draw it like something like this, right? A goes from here to here. B goes from here to here. And then oh, I guess maybe they can have no intersection. This feels like an interesting lemma to prove. We're gonna have to look further into this. Because if we prove that intersections aren't allowed, that's very strong. But if not, well, it's it's like it's, it's like a try. When you have ideas, you want to go for them because um even the most random ideas, if they turn out true, if you know they're gonna help you a lot, it can be very useful. So the one, like for general polynomials, this obviously isn't true, but maybe, just maybe for monic polynomials, it might be. Um, but now that I'm looking at this further, maybe not as well. We'll have to see. Um, okay, we'll leave this idea be, maybe we'll come back to it later. So it looks like we haven't gotten any major progress just by looking at the polynomial directly with 2016 zeros. So maybe let's take a look at some smaller cases to see if we can get some inspiration, which is another idea from combinatorics, because this is a very combinatorically flavored question because we're doing a lot of experimentation. We need to find the construction. So when it's x minus one alone, it's pretty obvious uh, because we have to remove one of the factors so 
we remove this one. Oh, it doesn't even make sense in this case because if you erase uh, one factor, then no more factors remain on either side. So let's look at a different case. Um, how about the x minus one times x minus two case? So in this case, um, on one side, we can remove this x minus one term, so it's x minus two. On the other side, we can remove this x minus two term, so it's x minus one. This is the minimum we have to do because we can't have a shared factor on both sides. And x minus one equals x minus two has no solutions. Just because like, well, if you just subtract from both sides, it's yes, one equals zero, which is a contradiction. So it looks like k just equals one for this case. So that makes me wonder, can we just have k equal to 2016, that would make the question incredibly easy. So it wouldn't be deserving, let's say six number. So it's gotta be harder than that. So let's take a few more cases. X minus one, X minus two, and X minus three. So this quadratic factor is gonna be positive it's going to grow very fast. So our linear factor would have to pass entirely under the quadratic factor on one side or another. So it's zero has to lie outside the parabola because if it was lying inside the parabola, then um, I'm pretty sure no matter how you draw the line, you're going to intersect the parabola. Uh, so we, have, we can have the line have, well, to be honest, it doesn't matter doesn't matter whether we, we look at these equations. No, it doesn't. So the set of zeros is from 1 to 2016. Um, and it's like consecutive integers. So it doesn't really matter if we reflect it across the middle, because we're really talking about the same set. So we can just say without loss of generality, if we only remove, um, oh, sorry, k equals 2. If we only remove three factors, then it has to be um, x minus 3 as a linear factor and x minus 1 and x minus 2 as a quadratic factor. But does this actually work is the real question. x squared minus 3x plus 2 equals x minus 3. So we can subtract and it's x squared minus 4x plus 5 equals 0, which does indeed have no solutions. And this is very promising. Uh, and this is because this is x minus 2 squared plus 1. And the square component has to be non-negative, and we're adding 1, so it has to be positive. So it has no real solutions. So this seems very promising, because if we already know it, there has to be at least 2016 solutions removed just because one factor can't be on both sides of the equations. Um, well, because then they would share a root, right? Um, but it can't be that easy. It couldn't possibly be that easy. So we're going to keep this idea on hold, but we know this works for k equals 3. So it's going to be very interesting now to see where this idea starts going wrong. Because surely at some value of k, uh, this um, the same argument is going to stop working. Although before we move on, let's see if we can prove that this equation, x minus 1 times x minus 2 equals x minus 3, has no solutions algebraically. So not by expansion, um, because if we get an algebraic argument, there's a better chance that we can adapt it to higher uh, with more complex cases. So let's see if we can understand this. X minus one and X minus two, and there's X minus three. What does it mean for this line here to be lying completely below the parabola? Um, well, Here's a zero, here's a line. How can we prove? So, what is the slope of the parabola at this point? I'm just curious. Or, hmm. It doesn't really matter because whatever the slope is, it's still going to intersect this line. Usually to actually prove it, you would 
do this expansion method, or you could draw a line on the parabola tangent to this line. But it's a bit hard to adapt this argument to bigger dimensions just because um, in higher dimensions, maybe this won't be a line, maybe this will be a conic, like a parabola or a cubic curve, and you won't have a tangent line. But we don't need to let go of our little dream that perhaps we can just use a line, a single degree line as our second term, because we obviously can't remove all the terms from our second part of the equation, but we can remove all but one, so that's only a line. So let's, let's try this approach. This line has slope one. So as long as we find the tangent curves to this curve that have slope one, now my drawing is a bit bad, but let me retry this. We wanna show that there are no intersections. So if we show that all the tangent lines with slope one on this curve lie, up, lie to the left of this line with slope one, which is x minus three, um, then we can show that there's no intersections. And remember, we're just trying to do this algebraically so that we can adapt arguments in the higher dimensions. So when does the slope of this parabola have slope one? Mm. Well, first of all, at x minus two, what is the slope of the parabola? Uh, we can take a derivative. Uh, oh, and derivatives work very nicely in this case because really well known that if you have a bunch of linear factors like x minus a times x minus b times x minus c, when you take a derivative in the function, the product rule ex uh, expands nicely. So, oh, it's going to equal like, if you take a derivative of the first term times the rest plus the derivative of the second term times the rest plus the derivative of the third one times the rest. So it's going to look like the sum of or in the cyclic sum of x minus b times x minus c, because the derivative of x minus a is just one. So this doesn't look too useful, but at least in this small case here, in this question, we can apply to find the slope at this point, because at this point, it's just very, I'm just very curious what it actually is. So if we do plug in two to this equation here, uh, we get that the slope here is exactly one. And that's basically, that's probably almost certainly the only solution on the parabola that's tangent to this line. So we did get a bit lucky there. Um, the slope is precisely one at this point so that there would be no intersections. Okay, so now that we've done an algebraic proof at least and looked at some interesting ideas, Let's return to the question and now start rising into higher dimensions. Because if we just settled with this uh, bounding solution, bounding is honestly a fine way to prove things, but you should only use it once you already know what you want to prove. Because bounding is an effective way to prove things, but it doesn't tell you too much that you can generalize. If you're still in the stage where you're trying to figure out what the answer is, get the ideas behind the question, you're really going to want to use some kind of a combinatorical or algebraic argument rather than bounding because just the, the gain in insight is so important. So let's go into four dimensions or sorry, four roots, x minus one, um, x minus two, x minus three. Um, so actually, the first thing that comes to mind when I write this equation is, well, if, you, if you're going to split these terms, if k does equal 4, then you're going to have to split it as two quadratics or one linear in the rest. Um, we already know that since the cubic curve rises faster, uh, wait, yeah, since any curve will approach infinity at two points, it's effectively going to, like, if you look at it asymptotically, it's going to cut the plane into two. So one part is going to be to its left and one part to its right. So if you have any line um, going through like another root in here, you're going to have to cross the prob. Uh, you're going to have to cross the curve at some point. It's almost like, I guess it's kind of topology, because there's a left part of the curve and a right part of the curve. Um, 
and eventually they do like the curve looks like it's vertical because the things increase so quick like you could it's just like a zoom on desmos or something um yeah like a zoom on desmos so your slope one curve eventually has to intersect a curve um all of these arguments you can present nicer when you actually need them for the proof but right now they're just in the form of intuition so a linear factor within must intersect it so for the linear case we have to separate x minus four as the only linear factor but for the quadratic case if we take this pair and this pair i talked about this before would you have two even functions um so even though they're separate from each other where their where their roots are um, this one has to approach infinity in this direction. This one has to approach infinity in this direction. It's just not going to work out too well for you, especially since these two are literally just a shift of each other. There's no way to avoid this by putting one inside the other. But there could be one inside the other if one has the roots two and three and the other has the roots one and four. And surprisingly, that actually works. Um, X minus one times X minus four. Now that I think about it, is a much easier solution than a linear one, but we're still gonna try the linear one because we're gonna want to generalize in higher dimensions. But for now, this solution works because once you expand it, it's x squared minus five x plus four equals x squared minus five x plus six. So you can cancel the quadratic and linear terms. So this equals six, I mean, four equals six, which obviously has no real solutions. So this pair of curve actually works. And on the graph, it looks something like here we have a parabola, and then here we have another parabola. Although it may not look just as good as I have it in this picture. Um, it could be the case that this parabola increases rapidly. Well, generally they increase at a similar growth rate, I'd assume, but it's not exactly obvious. They could be different shapes. This one could be like this, and that one could be like that. Anyways, um, it seems like this works, but let's test our hypothesis to see if the linear factor does indeed generalize. So we have x minus one, x minus two, and x minus three, and x minus four. Unfortunately, we're in a bit of a pickle here because it turns out this is definitely not going to work. Because this here is a cubic, right? With the same argument we said before, the cubic is eventually going to split the board in two. So our linear factor has to intersect it at some point, because our linear needs to go from the bottom left of the board to the bottom right of the graph. Sorry, not board, the graph. Um, so this is definitely not going to work. Maybe it works for even cases, though. So now let's go out of our way to look at the k equals the five case. So in this case, it's still k equals four. It's starting to build an interesting pattern. It suggests that k will equal 2016, but there's a bit of doubt involved because there's really no consistent way to solve these equations yet. But keep in mind, something a pattern is arising. In this first case, we split into degree one and one. The second one, we did one and two. The, uh, the third case, or this uh, k equals four case, we split it into two and two. So it suggests that maybe next is two and three, and then three and three, and then three and four, and then four and four, and so on. But this remains to be shown. So first, let's see if we can cheese the solution by doing the linear factor whenever we need, um, or when, when, whenever we have an odd k. And the k I'm talking about isn't really the k in the question. It's just um, the number of factors. So the roots are one to k inclusive. So does this have any roots is the question now. Uh, x minus one, x minus two, x minus three, x minus four. Mm. Unfortunately, I think our linear factor trick doesn't work in these higher dimensions because maybe this specific case might work. I don't actually know. But as the number of terms here grows larger and larger, um, let's say our x was 2.5, uh, only these two terms would be like 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, only they would be less than one. All the other terms would be very big. Like if it was 2.5, this would be 1.5, this would be 1.5, or the magnitude would be 
And for other terms, it'd be 2.5 and 3.5 and so on. So only these two terms reduce the magnitude and all other terms increase the magnitude significantly. So as terms go up um, the polynomial, what, what, what I mean is the polynomial will become more and more spiky. Um, and the spikiness increases like a factorial. So a line, it just has slope one. So maybe initially it doesn't pass through the other function because it's just sort of spiky. But as the function gets more and more spiky, um, as the height, as we add more factors, gets higher and higher factorially, eventually it's surely going to cross the linear factor. So eventually the linear trick is not going to work. But we know from earlier cases, see, this is why we need to go up in cases to see if we can find patterns. We know earlier cases seem to suggest that we can find a pair where it's like two factors times three factors. Uh, I mean, two factors versus three factors, where the two factor one is um, does not intersect the three factor one. So let's see if we can actually prove it though. And interestingly, it seems that we're approaching some kind of an inductive argument because, I mean, it's combinatorics. You gotta always have induction in mind when you're coming up with the constructions. But this is x minus one, x minus two. At this step, all we did was we, well, if you ignore the reflectional symmetry, all we did was add an extra term to one side of the equation. And here, all we did was add another extra term to the other side of the equation ignoring reflectional symmetry, of course. Well, there is some reflectional symmetry involved to make it possible to add it to the side of the equation with x minus one, or in other words, the smallest term. So let's see what the pattern is. x minus one, x minus two. Uh, let's phrase this a bit differently um, to try to maintain symmetry. Or can we maintain symmetry? because we need to add x minus three to the side without x minus one, x minus two. Oh yeah, we can maintain symmetry because you can also think of it as x minus one alone equals x minus two times x minus three. So when we had um, x minus one, x minus two, we then added the new factor to this side of the equation, the side that doesn't have one on it. And then we add the new biggest factor to the side that does have one. So it almost seems to be suggesting that we add the newer factor with x minus five to this side of the equation that does have x minus two on it. And now let's go ahead and take a look at what would happen. Um, if this does work, then we got an easy way out because right now we've still done very little thinking into the actual depth of this question. So let's try to figure out what would happen. Um, currently x minus two, x minus three is a parabola nested inside another parabola. When it's below five, um, the parabola will be like this. And then at five, it'll be like this. So it really does feel like, does it though? No, it does not maybe. Um, so oh, maybe it doesn't, I think it doesn't actually, because we have this parabola x minus one, x minus four. Um, the cubic curve has to have three roots, two, three, and five. But the issue is this parabola splits the plane in two parts. There's a left, there's this part above the parabola and this part below the parabola. So since we have roots above the parabola and root below the parabola, any continuous curve needs to cross this curve to get to all three points. It's just like topology, yeah? Because you can think of this parabola as something that separates the plane in two parts. So I think we are actually getting an intuition here. And basically what it's saying is um, the second curve can't have roots both above and below the other curve. So it's a bit different from our other argument. Well, oh, it does build into our argument, our previous idea. This is a lemma we had previously on the, um, in the video, which says that one curve can't have two zeros and the other curve has two zeros so that, uh, the pair of zeros like cross each other, um, in this way, like it can be within the other, like in this case, one and four are like this, and the other pairs within the other, two and three are between one and four, but it can't be intersecting each other. And now we finally, well, do we see why? Let's take, let's think for a moment. Um, since there's no double roots, we know that the polynomial must cross from being positive to negative at each zero. 
So um, let's say this does happen. Then both of these zeros must be above or below the polynomial. So, oh, it can actually be the case. If the, poly if the polynomial is something like this, then both of these roots are indeed above the polynomial. <laughs> but maybe there's a better way of phrasing the question. Um, 4k equals 4, actually, uh, up to k equals 4, everything seems to suggest that the least possible value of k is actually equal to the number of roots involved in the question. So let's try to prove that for now. And if we find a counterexample, we can backtrack. And in fact, finding a counterexample is great for us because it's going to bring us a lot closer to finding the true answer to the question, if it, it is the case that the true answer isn't k. So um, let's take a look at this. Because this condition that all the roots lie on one side of the polynomial is, it, it honestly feels very strong. Like a lot of things could be done with this fact. Like the simplest fact is, let's say there's no other roots for the other polynomial between them. Then the other polynomial, if it passes like below the real number line and this passes above the real number line, then it forces intersections. It's just, it feels like this, this reduction to the question to having all the roots above or below the polynomial above or below the polynomial makes it a lot more combinatorical. Like there's a lot more arguments involved. So we're definitely going to move in this direction in a second. I just want to take one more second to look at this k equals five case to see if there is a simple solution just before we move on, right? Um, maybe no. I was thinking if we put a parabola here and a cubic curve here, but that's impossible because the cubic grows faster than the parabola, so they're gonna intersect again. However, what if we put the cubic curve to the left? And then, no, that wouldn't work either because the parabola would intersect the cubic curve on the left. Hmm. So if there is a solution, there has to be one term or one polynomial that's degree even. So since it's degree even, um, all, the, all the numbers to the left of its uh, leftmost root and to the right of its rightmost root have to be roots of the other polynomial. Or like the other polynomial could lie inside, but that would, because, okay, if, if a polynomial is even and the other polynomial lies entirely on the above side of the polynomial, then the other polynomial can approach negative infinity on the left. So it would have to be even too, but that's impossible because we're looking at an odd k. Uh, and technically we only need to look at even k, but I guess it's almost just a curiosity to see what happens for odd k, like in this k equals five case. So that means the cubic polynomial would have to lie outside. Oh, but this makes, Maybe this, does it work? No. So the cubic polynomial would have to lie outside. Well, okay, let's not forget that this could be a quadric polynomial um, involved, but if it was a cubic polynomial involved, then it would have, it would have to have a root to the right. Because if it has a root to the left, um, it would have to intersect the parabola, right? Right? Yeah, because after its last root, it's increasing always. After the last root of a polynomial, it's always going to be increasing just because the leading coefficient is one. Um, so, it's always going to be increasing. Yeah, and that would force it to intersect this polynomial. So, the last root has to be on the right here, but the issue is it's growing faster than the quadratic is growing. So, that would imply that they intersect again. So, it can't be the product of a quadratic and a cubic. Um, now let's look at a quadric and a linear term. Let's see if we can figure this out. So the quadric term is something like this, and the linear term has to lie outside of it. Um, it can't have any roots inside. So um, since it would only have a single root, just pretend I drew a curve with four intersections. Um, it has to be this rightmost term here, or the uh, leftmost term. Let's just assume it's the rightmost, because we have reflectional symmetry. So our two polynomials are x 
oh, th they're exactly the ones I've written here, x1 times x2 times x3 times x4 equals x minus five. And now let's think whether they have an intersection or not. Um, obviously they don't have an intersection past this point because past this point, um, the slope is gonna be very positive. I mean, it's a high degree polynomial. It's gonna be growing much faster than a linear function. So the real question is, do they intersect to the left of this point? Um, and that is a good question. Let's see. So they obviously don't intersect on this interval. Do they intersect to the left at this point? Um, well, I think the simplest way we can approach this question hmm. I think the, the polynomial is going to be most negative here, um, just by looking at the magnitudes of the differences. So let's plug in 3.5 to see if we get a contradiction. When x is 3.5, what do we get? Um, left side is 2.5. It's 2.5 times 1.5 times 0 0.5 times negative 0 0.5. which is along the lines of 300 and 355, no, 375 divided by, oh, 3.75 divided by four. Um, Ooh, I, I don't think these curves intersect, but as I said before, so okay, it does equal k equals five miraculously for um, this k equals five case. But as I said before, I have a sneaking suspicion, a small sneaking suspicion, yeah, that the linear argument no longer works for bigger cases. Because as we get bigger and bigger, these two reducing terms are always gonna be 0 0.5, but these terms are gonna get bigger and bigger. It's gonna be 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, it's going to grow like a factorial and eventually it's just going to be too uh it's going to be too negative at this first intersect uh, at this first minimum here that it has to intersect the linear factor so miraculously we get k equals five but i'm starting to get doubts you know but also on the other hand maybe i don't have doubts because this is an odd k and there's even the problem here is that we don't have with even k for example we're forced to have an even polynomial we saw that issue already um, so let's look further, okay? Let's go investigate this argument. Um, we're gonna move away from uh, the small cases. We're gonna start looking into more general arguments back into the big case because we've taken our little expedition in small cases. We have observed some patterns, but now we're really gonna start looking into each pattern to see if which ones are true and which ones are false. And by far the most promising one is definitely this one. So let's clear everything we have right now. and take a look at the root form. So each polynomial has a set of roots. Let's actually use colors so we know which polynomials they belong to. Let's say this set of roots belongs to A, or the polynomial on the left side, and this set of roots belongs to the polynomial on the right side. Both polynomials are positive, up here in, in this interval. So we'll say red is positive here. Um, and after each root, since there's no double roots, we know it has to cross the number line. So red goes negative here, and it's positive here, here, and negative here and here. Um, so since either red is always above blue or blue is always above red, uh, well, we know blue is always positive after its last root. So 
um, red only becomes positive later on, which means blue, since its last root is to the left of red, has to be greater than red. And by similar argument, um, what we can say is, yeah, um, since blue, blue's yeah, since blue has the first argument, blue has to be. Well, okay, the first argument is less obvious because it's not positive necessarily. It could go down or it can go up. Um, it's not exactly obvious. So let's avoid specifically dealing with that. Um, and let's focus more on the right side. So whichever one has the most rightmost last root is going to be under the other one. So red is below the blue one, which means when red is positive, blue has to be positive. Um, and that's not true because after this last blue term, since blue was positive to the right of this blue term, so um, let me get to find the blue color. Since blue looks like this to the right of the blue term, it was positive here. So it would have to be negative here. But since red is positive here, we've violated the inequality because blue has to always be greater than or equal to red. Otherwise, um, well, if this is not true, then since blue is greater than or equal to red here and it's less than red at some other point, that would imply that at some point that polynomials intersect with each other because that's the only way they can move sides from one side of the polynomial to the other side. So what can we conclude from this? Uh, we can conclude that after uh, the, the, the term immediately after, I mean, before the rightmost blue has to be blue as well. So let's erase. Where is it, eraser? This red point, and let's say the red point was here instead. Over here. Then now do the signatures match up? Um, do they match up? Well, let's take a look. And let's erase this blue curve here because it kind of makes things harder to see. Let's erase this, erase these signs because they're now going to be different. So red is positive here, negative here, positive here, and negative here. On the other hand, blue is positive in all of these cases to the right. Um, it's negative here. Oh, but we have an issue again because blue has to be above red, but here red is positive and blue is negative. So it's not actually the fact that red was between these blues. Rather, it's just the fact that red was positive going into the first blue root. So that means the number of reds to the right of the first, oh, by first I mean the rightmost, the number of reds to the right of this rightmost blue has to be odd so that red can be negative in this section so that when blue goes negative, red is under it. So let's change up our configuration of points again. So let's say it's blue, 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 and then let's put two reds here and one red to the right, like that. Um, And let's try to do the same argument. So red is positive here, negative here, negative here, positive here, negative here, and negative here. And blue is positive here and here, negative here, negative here, which violates this plus sign here. So red can never turn positive while it's still between these two blues because that would violate the argument. So now we know the number of reds to the right of the rightmost blue has to be odd, and the one to the left of the rightmost blue has to be another blue. Um, so of course, like you can say, oh, if you're just all blue on the left and all right, or all red on the right, everything is resolved. But we're really trying to figure out what the exact set of possible root configurations are. That way, we get a bigger picture. Now you might say, like what's really the point of trying to figure out the reconfiguration? 
if it might not be exactly k? Well, the key always is you should never be looking at like proving things that you know are shorter because really at this point, we don't know what the answer is. It's always exploration. So we want to know as much as possible without like caring about how we're going to improve the question in the end. So let's look at the newly developed configuration that seems to be the new most promising solution. If we have three blue dots in this configuration, two red dots here, two red roots, and one red root here, now do we have a solution? Um, so red is positive here, negative here, here and here, positive here, and negative here and here. Blue, on the other hand, is positive here, here, here. It's negative here, but that's fine because red is also negative here. And it's positive here, positive here, positive here, and negative here. And look, everything fits perfectly. Blue is always above red. Now, what can we really learn from this situation? Well, it really didn't matter if we had two blues here. Uh, the real argument was that we can't have three blues in this first section. Because if we had three blues, then the blue would go negative at a time when reds are going positive, and that would be bad. So really, our argument tells us that uh, after the section of reds, there has to be an even number of blues. And this section really tells us that after a section of blues, there has to be an even number of reds uh, because here, because there's even number of blues to the right, blue has to be positive. And if we have an odd number of reds, then when blue is going negative, our reds would be positive. So all that tells us is that we have an even number of reds to the left of the rightmost section of blues. So our, our reds are going negative. And by the same argument we used here, I'm almost certain that we can say that we have an even number of blues here, and then even number of reds, and then even number of blues, and then reds, and blues, and reds, and blues, and reds, and blues, and reds, until we get to the very end, in which case we have like an extra blue, an extra red. Um, this is a very, 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 very good start. Why? Because um, once we know this fact that blue and red all appear evenly, now we're starting to get into the territory where it's starting to help our construction. Right now, we're proving things about a construction if it does exist. It's a common technique you'll see. Um, we should be trying to construct a construction, but often it's more helpful for us to find the construction by assuming one exists and seeing what properties it might have so that we ourselves can actually construct it. So we have this major, 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 major result that um, if there's an odd number of reds on the right side, then all blues and all reds will occur like in even pairs. Um, although that does make me wonder, what if the number of reds to this right side is even instead of odd? That would cause red to be positive here, which is a contradiction because blue is positive on, on that interval. So in fact, it's even stronger. We have an odd number of reds to the right and then even blues, even reds, even blues. Um, since k in fact is even, and at this point, I'm pretty sure we're just gonna have to drop the odd k case because there are some really nice properties that only arise when it's um, when it's even. Since since all of these are even and the number of reds to the very rightmost was odd, uh, that would imply that the very leftmost root, which we know has to be blue because, um, well, do we know it has to be blue? Let's think. Uh, First, let's erase this even, and it would have to be odd and blue. Do we know the leftmost root has to belong to blue? Well, blue always lies above red, right? So if the leftmost belongs to red, it has to lie below the blue curve. Oh, it does work, I guess, because like our k equals four proof, our k equals four case is proof of this, because our blue curve looked like this and our red curve looked like this. So this the final odd one could belong to red. Um, 
So let's just draw the curve. Oops, let's use the right color arrow. This is one configuration, one possible configuration. And the other possible configuration is if blue is even and red gets an odd number on both ends. So something like this. Um, and let's draw a zero line as well. Oh, that wrong color. So as you can see, um, this here, this section is an odd number of red roots, even number of blue roots, even number of red roots, even number of blue roots. It could be four, it could be two, it doesn't really matter, and an odd number of red roots. Now, let's do the fun part where we see if we can prove that this condition might possibly be enough to settle the question. In other words, if we just alternate blue and red, it honestly probably is not. But I do just want to take a look, take a think, you know? Perhaps it is. You can never really tell. So if there was a counterexample, um, then blue and red have to intersect somewhere. It can't be when one is positive and one is negative. It has to be when both is positive. So my intuition tells me, uh, like, okay, when, when the leading coefficient is monic, uh, the spikiness or how high the polynomial travels when it goes over, like between each zero, the spikiness is a polynomial. You can't artificially increase the spikiness by increasing the coefficient. So it all just depends on the degree of the polynomial. And my intuition says, if the degrees of the polynomial are equal or close enough to each other, that one can't outspike the other. That's what it feels like. Um, just because spikiness is heavily related to the, the to the degree, like we saw before, because the qu the quadric um, curve was more well as it, the quadric one worked because it was lucky, but as we get to the degree six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, eventually the spikiness will start growing factorially, and there would be no chance for the linear factor to grow faster than that. So now I have a very 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 incredibly strong claim which is that we can construct a polynomial straight based on these two constructions. Um, now there's two possibilities here. The simplest one is the one we've drawn where everything comes in, uh, in, in a sequence of one root, two roots, two roots, one root, or like one, two, 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 one, or like in that order. Also possible is our initial idea of having all the blue roots to the left and then all the red roots to the right. But now we know there have to be an odd number of red roots and an odd number of blue roots. Um, and is that true? It's not true for 2016 because this would have 1,008 roots. And oh, we had this exact same conversation when we first started this question, which was that because it's 108 roots, this would be too high and these two would intersect on the left and right. But it was 2014, this argument I think would work indeed because this polynomial grows fastest when it's past its rightmost root. And this polynomial grows its fast, drops its fastest when it's below the leftmost root. So it does feel like to me that these two polynomials will not intersect. But sadly, this isn't the case. We're not so lucky as to have um, such a distribution. Uh, what, what we do know is the parity, well, of course we know that the parity of the, um, the parity of the number of roots of the red one and the number of roots of the blue one are the same, but that just follows just because um, they, well, there's only 2016 roots and that's an even number. So if one polynomial has even number of roots, the other one has an even number, same for the other one. If one has odd, then the other has odd. So let's see if maybe we can do this construction instead. Uh, what is 2016 equal to? It's 1,008 times two. 1,008 again is 504 times two. Oh, there's too many factors of two. So even if we went for this little construction where um, we put a bunch of red roots and then a bunch of blue roots 
and then a bunch of red roots. Uh, this one will work because the number of red roots is not odd. It would be uh, 504, which is even. So as I looked at this more and more, um, so when you make a construction, what you really do not want to make a very complicated construction that's like very specific. Like I'm going to choose two, three, five, seven, 12 for like the red polynomial. First of all, it's going to be very hard to prove. You're probably going to need a computer, which you don't have when you're trying to prove these questions. Um, and second of all, it's just much easier if you can find a solution that has a simpler argument. And those really come in the form of elegant solutions like this one, like the most basic pair uh, of situation one, and the second one, which is the most basic situation of situation two. So since these purest solutions don't work, it's highly likely that um, like these types of solutions that are super pure will work in general. So I think that's a good sign for us to start approaching the other pure argument in this in this, in in the pure sense that it's uh, that there's that the number of roots in each section is perfect. It's one two 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 two, 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 two until it becomes one again. Um, and actually, if we look at the counterexamples we had in the very beginning, it's very important to once you get information to corroborate with like previous facts you know. Um, in the k equals two case, it was one and one, and in the k equals four case, it was one two one. So it seems to suggest that everything should work out for us. Now, surprisingly, this is really nice for us too because there's a very interesting symmetry going on, um, which we can maybe exploit. So let's clear the board once more. Um, in this construction where we have one red root, two blue roots, and let's just do the k equals six case, just see if we can prove it. Because once we get a number as big as six, it's going to be very, incredibly easy. Well, maybe not in a number theory question, but in an algebra question, once we get that k equals six, it's going to be incredibly easy to generalize into higher dimension. So let's see if we can prove this is true. Now, the thing I was saying was special about this polynomial is notice that the roots are symmetric over the center line. It's a very interesting um, idea that we've talked about several times. When we have all these consecutive numbers, they're symmetric over the center line. And in this construction specifically, it's even more symmetric. So what that tells us is, um, also I, I messed up the coloration a bit for you guys because now the red one's the one on top because the rightmost root of the red one is to the left of the rightmost root of the blue one. But um, just deal with it, I guess. Um, let's draw in the red curve. Um, it'll look something like this, I think. Bad curve drawing, just the many challenges of drawing on a bad whiteboard. And then we have the blue one. So the fact that they're symmetric over this line tells us what? Oh, wait, they're not symmetric over this line, are they? Ah, they're not symmetric over this line, specifically because they're cubic. Um, okay, I think I, this case might be easy to prove. I'm actually quite certain. Let me think. This, I don't know about this case, but uh, if we look back at our situations, this situation forces there to be an odd number of red roots, which we can't really have because in this case, if we pair them, we put all the roots, some to the red and some to the blue, so that they have the same degree. So to avoid like any extra intersections or something, um, that would give us a thousand eight red roots and a thousand eight blue roots, which makes it so that the situation can happen because the situation needs the number of red roots to be odd. So let's actually just abandon this one and look at the other situation. So goodbye drawing. And this time, actually, I can actually do it correctly. Um, and we're actually going to do it with eight because that's the one most faithful to our original coloring. Um, we have red, blue, blue. Okay, so maybe I did lie a little bit about the symmetry because it's no longer present in this case. Well, it's still present. Uh, we'll see what we can actually do with it, though. Um, but it was an interesting idea for the other case, I'm certain 
it would have made some promising headway. But that's really not the case we're trying to look at. What we're really trying to look at is a situation two here, because this is the case that's actually relevant to us solving the question. Um, and usually, I'm, I'm going to be honest, usually I don't, usually you don't abandon cases like odd and like just, we straight up abandon all odd cases and all cases that are not multiples of four. But um, for this algebra question specifically, the behavior is so dependent on like the, the specific set of roots that um, it's kind of justified. I mean, we're constructing anyways. We have the freedom, like there are certain guidelines when you're doing exploration, but once we get this idea that this looks like a really promising solution, um, I can feel that we're getting closer and closer to the exact solution. So this is when we can start making tightening assumptions. We can start using proving methods rather than methods that generate insight. Though, of course, I can always be speaking to you soon. So don't discount that. Um, so our goal here is to prove that the red curve and the blue curve do not intersect. And they're both even, so they both approach infinity on both sides. Let's make that look a little bit better. So how would you even begin to start proving this is really my question. Because it's definitely not something obvious. Or at least at first it isn't very obvious to me. So let's think about it. Like, of course, if you wanted to go pure in the other direction, like we had previously, you could put one red root on the left side, um, do a bunch of half of the blue roots here, do rest of the red roots here, an even number, do the rest of the blue roots here, and then do a single red root here. This is possible because it's pure in the sense that there's very few connected components. So I think it's worth looking at this alternative construction. Um, to put it, and, and this is identical to this construction, at least in this small case, because all the red ones are in the middle here. Um, would this construction work though? It does make me curious. I really don't know, because um, when all the roots of red are here in the middle, while all the roots for blue are here on the sides, um, it's a bit hard to say. There's definitely some inequalities involved. I do think it's possible to prove this though. Um, okay, so we have two actually, two possibilities in question. We have, we saw this one, two, two, one, one, but we really need to start trying to figure out what makes this easier to prove. Because if we can't find an obvious argument, we might have to go with this argument here. So let's see if we can figure this out. A red root, two blue roots, and a red root, two red roots. So the pattern is like this. It's red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red. After each pair of red, blue, um, after each pair of red, blue uh, is really where, we, where we're going to want to look at the functions. Because if you're between a red and blue pair, the red function is going to be negative and the blue function is going to be positive. So of course, there's no way they're going to intersect. So really, the critical spots we're going to be looking at are at, at this little um, bottom peak here, at this little bottom peak here, and this little top peak of the red here. So in other words, in between each of these um, peaks for the red and blue. And what we're going to be looking out for is in case one of these peaks overpeaks the other one. So if the red one starts below, but for some reason goes above the blue curve, that's what we're really going to be looking out for. Um, now, in the middle, it's really easy because uh, we know the maximum of the curve would have to be at the very top. And it's probably very easy to compare these two tops um, because you can just plug in the value and try some inequalities. But at these side bumps, it's a little less obvious, at least to me, because the maximum or the minimum of these two functions isn't really clear. 
let's think though, how will we prove one function is always greater than or equal to the other one? What would that look like? What would that look like? Oh, interesting. What would that look like? Mm. So I'm going through a few ideas here. Um, the first thing I thought of was can we um, just do a straight up inequality between the two? Like uh, if we can find some way to show the inequality that this one is greater than equal to this one, but it's not so obvious. But what I remembered is back when we had that k equals four case, we sort of expanded the product of these two red ones, x, x minus two times x minus three, and we expanded x minus one times x minus four. And um, the first two parts were the same, and the first two parts of these two were the same. Uh, both of them started with x squared minus 5x, but the constant term of the 2 and 3 was higher than the constant term of the, uh, of the 1 and 4, which allowed us to finish the proof. So that makes me interested, because maybe we can try some similar argument in this case. Because if we pair up each group of 4, perhaps, hmm, but it's definitely not obvious. I think some further thinking is necessary. Um, because if we did pair them up right now, this gives six, this gives four. This pair here gives, this is six times seven, 42. And this pair here gives five times eight is 40. Um, if, you, if you try to multiply them again, these numbers don't sum up to the same number. So if you multiply the, them again, the linear factors don't cancel out, which is unfortunate. However, I do think we're getting at something here. Maybe it's maybe we can just straight up expand both polynomials, just multiply them out and see what happens. That's an interesting idea. And it might even work, actually. If we can prove all the coefficients of one term are greater than or equal to all the coefficients of the other. Um, well, first of all, do we know that the functions don't intersect to the left of this line or to in, basically in the negative numbers? Do we know they don't intersect for negative numbers? Um, I assume they don't. There's no way this red one outpaces the blue one. But how do we prove it is the question. Here, I'm starting to get closer and closer to the idea of majorization. So the reason I want to first remove this negative number set is because now that I think about it, the red set of roots majorizes the blue set of roots. What that means is um, majorization is kind of a complex topic, but let's say we have sequences A1, A2 to An, and then we have another sequence B1, B2 up to Bn. And we say the sequence A majorizes B. If A1 is greater than equal to B1, A2 is greater than equal to B2. Oh, sorry, a1 plus a2, so the partial sums are greater than or equal to b, b1 plus b2. Um, a1 plus a2 plus a3 is greater than or equal to b1 plus b2 plus b3, and so on. So maybe b2 is greater than or equal to a1, like in, in this case, um, oh, sorry, and there's also the additional constraint. Sorry, I should have finished this. Um, Ooh, I can no longer edit the text that I drew, but you also have the constraint that a1 is greater than a2, is greater than a3, is greater than an. There's an order, or greater than or equal to, and b1 is greater than or equal to b2, up to bn. Um, then a majorizes b if a1 is greater than or equal to b1, and then a2 plus b2. So this, this, for example, in this case, this would be a1. 
This here would be B1, this would be B2, this would be A2. So it's not necessary for A2 to be greater than B2, it's just necessary for A1 plus A2 to be greater than B1 plus B2. And since everything comes in these groups of four, and in each group of four, A1 plus A2 is exactly B1 plus B2, and A1 specifically is greater than equal to B1, um, the sequence of red roots does indeed majorize the set of blue roots. And this can help us a lot when we try to expand the polynomials because products are well known to be, um, okay, so the reason majorization is important is because Jensen's theorem, which is quite a famous inequality, says that if one sequence A, if one sequence of A1 majorizes another sequence B, then F of A1 plus F of A2, or just F of each term of the A sequence is the sum of that is greater than or equal to F of each term with the B sequence, provided that F is a convex function. Uh, and it's the other way of it's concave. But when we take a product, like A1 times A2, plus like things like this, that, that happen when you do expand the polynomials, uh, this feels like very majorization-like. So I think it's an interesting idea that maybe we can utilize. Um, so let's think about this. Our two polynomials are x minus each of the a1s up to an, and x minus each of the b1s up to bn. And we want to prove one side is greater than the other side. We can't really use majorization because the function isn't actually convex everywhere or concave everywhere, unfortunately. Is that true though? Let me think for a moment. Because A1 is a red sequence and B1 is a blue sequence. A1 majorizes B the blue sequence. So when the functions are convex, like in this little interval here between these two points, is it convex in that interval? Um, ooh, it's, is it convex in the interval? It's, yeah, it has to be. Wait, does it? No, it's not necessarily true. That is unfortunate because there are inflection points all around the functions. So these inflection points mean that this these little intervals here aren't completely convex or concave. Um, I don't want to abandon this argument though, because let's look at the specific case for k equals eight. Our polynomials are x minus one. Uh, we want to show x minus two, x minus three, x minus six, x minus seven is greater than or equal to x minus one, x minus four, x minus five, and x minus eight. And if we actually expanded these polynomials, we get something like x to the fourth minus, um, I'll do this out for you guys, but usually since like they sum to the same number, you would just find out that it's equal on both sides. Um, this is minus 18 x cubed uh, plus, now this is some annoying computation we have to do, but I think we're getting really close to the answer. Um, 32 plus, 39, 31, plus 42. 113x squared minus, oh my goodness, minus 6 times 13, 78. 
10 288x plus 6 over 7 52 greater than or equal to x to the fourth. I just want to check how we can prove that one is greater than or equal to the other because the most obvious approach is we can prove that all the coefficients are going to equal to the other one, but this seems a little bit strong. I don't know if it's actually true or not. So I'm just testing it to see if we should prove coefficients are equal if we, or if we should just prove that equations are equal. I mean, one is greater than or equal to the other. Um, honestly, if I didn't find this majorization potential for like a proof, I would definitely start like looking at the other, other construction at this point which is to red, a bunch of blues, a bunch of reds, a bunch of blues, and one red dot. But for now, let's keep on looking, for, for just for now. Because um, it seems somewhat promising, at least. Greater than or equal to. x we work on the 18x cube plus sorry I, I just took a moment to think about like other ways we can prove this like we can also say like when we're between these two blue ones the magnitude of the blue products are less than the magnitude of the red ones and when we're between here the magnitude of the blue products are greater than the magnitudes of the red ones but it's not so obvious so i'm just gonna keep that idea open for later. But the point is we're so close that we're starting to get into proof techniques. And really we're just trying to find the one proof technique that works very slickly. Oh, I should not have tabbed out of this text box because now I need to redo it. I'll just add it to the end. Um, this here on the right is plus 17. Plus 52. That's 69, 109 squared minus, now groups of three, so 52 again, plus 200, 2x, plus the product, 160. So coefficient wise, it doesn't work look at this one and this one. However, objectively, does it work? The left side minus the right side is 4x squared minus 36x plus 92 is greater than zero. I'm sure this is true. Um, let's divide both sides by 4x squared minus 9x plus 23 zero. And um, the determinant of this is 81 minus 4 times 23, which is 92, which is negative 9, which is less than 0. So this inequality is indeed true. So the inequality is true. It's not true coefficient-wise. Really, we just need to prove why the inequality is true. It feels a ton to me like it should be majorization, but it really, really, really is not obvious why. It would be majorization because f is not convex, I think. Hmm. How do you prove one polynomial is greater than another? These polynomials are so related, and yet they're not so related, yeah? The annoying thing is it's a product rather than a sum.
Oh, but maybe that's exactly what we're looking for. Hold on here. F of A1, F of A2, F of B1, F of B2. There are some in this Jensen's inequality, but we would wish them to be a product because our polynomials are a product. So maybe the key here is to have F include a natural logarithm. It's a common idea when manipulating Jensen's product to work, Jensen's inequality to work with products. So we said F of, um, F of lambda to equal the natural log of x. Oh, but that is annoying because x minus a1 can be negative, theoretically. Let's just look at what it looks like. The natural log of x minus lambda. If it did work, then we would be able to sum all the natural logs and it would be GGs, we're done. But it's slightly less obvious because some of the terms are negative, but it's okay. Because if it's negative, we can take out the negative and still sum the natural log. So let's see if we can figure this out. So f of lambda is this. Um, oh, wait, it's weird. It's weird, it's weird. But okay, in this one case where it does work, in other words, when x is greater than all the roots, lambda, um, this, the derivative of natural log of x minus uh, lambda is one over x minus lambda. And if we take another derivative, it's um, negative one over x minus lambda squared. And this is concave. So um, the term that's smaller in the majorization is always going to have a sum that's greater than or equal to the term that's bigger in the majorization, which is how we can prove that um, this blue function is indeed greater than the red function when we're beyond this rightmost root. But the key point now is we want to prove it between this entire section. So for, by symmetry, this is also true beyond here. We want to prove in these critical sections here, this question mark here, this question mark here, and this question mark here. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, um, how can we adapt this natural log to work in these sections? Because if we could get that to work, it'd be so great. Um, let me just take a look though, actually. What if, what if it's lambda, I mean, natural log of theta minus x? Like, what would the magnitude in the product be? Because in the end, we just have to scale it by plus or minus one. Because um, really, in the critical sections where we actually care about the function, both of them are positive or both of them are negative. So we really don't need to mind um, the, the, we don't really need to mind the actual plus or minuses. We just need to figure out what the magnitude of the natural logs are so we can prove the natural logs of the blue function are going to go to the natural logs of the red one or the sum of them. So lin of lambda minus x, the derivative of that is negative one over lambda minus x. Which is x one over x minus lambda. Is that true? That's actually kind of cool. Wait, are you serious? The derivative of natural log of lambda minus x is negative of one over lambda minus x by the chain rule, which is one over x minus lambda. And that's the same as the derivative of, as other ones, it's also concave. Whoa, I think we're done here. Because since the derivatives is also concave, oh, it, we're so close. Um, my goodness. We are so, so, so close.
let's define a function natural log of absolute value of x minus theta, I mean x minus lambda. Then what does this function look like? So we have lambda, at which point the natural log is approaches infinity. And, oh, sorry, it approaches negative infinity. And then it increases like a natural log on the right and increases like a natural log on the left. It looks like this. It's concave in two sections. Um, and we're so, 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 so close. Um, we just need to prove that it holds. If it was concave in one section, it would be done already. It's just because the function is discontinuous, it's less obvious. So we have a section here, red definitely majorizes blue, that's obvious, but there's also this section here. How do we really reconvene these two sections? With Jensen's inequality. Because once we get that Jensen's inequality, everything finishes. Wait, I think, I'm, am I drawing this wrong? No, I'm not. Shouldn't the derivatives of these two functions be the same? Oh, sorry, this is a derivative with respect to lambda. Oh my goodness. This first one is, well, it's, it's one over, Yeah, it's one over lambda minus x. Okay, I reversed that a little bit. So, well, it doesn't matter too much. It's still concave in terms of lambda. Um, and the derivative of this. <clears throat> The derivative of one of these functions is the same as the derivative of the other one, which means if we increase one function and decrease another function by the same amount, no, that's not right. Man, we're so close, so close. Red major rises blue. If the line was drawn here, um, 
it doesn't matter the sign of these things, so we reflect blue and red over this line. Does that preserve the majorization? Yes, because red already majorized blue and now it's getting more majorizing. If we reflect here, does it preserve the majorization? Yes, because we have the added condition that the sum of these reds is exactly the sum of these blues. So we reflect over this center line here. Um, the sum of those two reds is also equal to the sum of those two blues. Uh, well, does it though? Because now they might appear in a different order. Oh, I see. I think we have the argument. Um, the key here is to use uh, the majorization arguments in blocks of four. Uh, by doing Jensen's inequality in each block of four, because each block of in each block of four, the set of reds does majorize the set of blues, right? And now we can use this uh, natural log function that we have. So let's clear um, the board and look at the final argument that we have. Um, so here we have the blue function on top. Um, let's give it all the undulations it needs. There we go. And let's have the red function. Little sketchy drawing skills here. Um, here we have its zeros. So red zero, um, red zero, red zero, red zero, blue zero, blue zero, blue zero, blue zero. And the key is to look at the function. Uh, okay, so. Um, right now, we want to prove that this indeed works, that blue is always greater than equal to red if we choose the roots in this one, two, one, two, 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 one pattern. And the key to that is using uh, Jensen's inequality in each group of four. So first of all, let's figure out which interval x lies in. If x lies in one of these intervals between red and blue, it's obvious that we're done because while well, the blue is positive and the red is negative. If x lies beyond here, uh, we can use this. Uh, the same argument we used just before to show that it's done with Jensen's inequality, but it's really identical to the argument I'm just I'm right I'm just about to give right now. So it's okay if you don't use that argument. Um, the key argument really is okay. So let's do one of the more simpler cases. If the x is in between a pair of reds, then it must split the entire board into groups of fours. So there could be another group of four, another red, blue, blue, red sequence here. We would just consider that on its own. So specifically, since x minus red times x times minus blue, like the, uh, we really just care about the magnitude of the products. We don't really care about their signs because we know their signs are the same. Um, the distance to this red times the distance to this blue is greater than the distance to this blue times, uh, to this blue times, oh, the, the greatest to this first red times the greatest to this farther red is greater than the distance to this first blue times the greatest of the, uh, to the distance to the second blue. And this is just a well-known fact. You could even do it with like a quadratic because um, there's just so many ways to prove this fact. But basically the product of the distances to the reds is greater than the distances to the blues. And similarly for each group of four, the product of the distances to the reds is uh, greater than the product of the distances to the blues. So the magnitude of the red product will always be, uh, or sorry, less than, I meant to say less than. Um, so the magnitude of the, uh, of the red product will always be less than the magnitude of the blue product. Therefore, when everything gets multiplied together, the blue product is greater than the red one. So now the blue function is greater than the red in this interval, no matter what x is, because we just treat each group of four alone. We don't need a big Jensen's inequality. We just treat each pair alone. Now, the real slightly more complicated one is here, um, if it appears in, in between two blue roots. Um, now, the key to realize here is we can still split everything into groups of four. And in all the other groups of four, it's still true that 
um, wait. Things are a bit different now because we want to prove that there's one more thought. I'm, we're so close. We want to prove that the magnitude of the reds is greater than the magnitude. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, we can split the rest of the picture into groups of fours starting from the splitting line. So here's a splitting line, split, splitting line. If we divide the rest of the page into groups of fours from the splitting line, like this group of four here, and if there was more like another red, blue, blue, red group, we could split this into a group of four and then have the blue, red remaining at the end. Um, the point is in each group of four, the distances, the product of distances to the reds is greater than the product of the distances to the blues. So we just need to care about this red blue pair here and this red blue pair here. And notice the distance to this blue. For both blues, is the distances to the blues are less than the distances to the red. So the product to the distances to the red is obviously also greater than the product of the distances to the blues for the edge pair, the pair of these two roots here and the pair of these two roots here. So in each group of four that we choose, the uh, the magnitudes of the distances to the reds is greater than the magnitude of the distances to the blues. So the entire product of the polynomial, the magnitude of the red function will be greater than that of the blue function. So the red will lie below the blue function when we're between two blue roots. The blue will be above the red function when we're between two red roots. And when we're between a red and blue roots, it's obvious because blue will be positive and red will be negative. Therefore, uh, we've proven that this one, two, 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 one pattern um, suffices. And uh, the one with the uh, the blue function will always be greater than the red function. And now we're done because we've just constructed k equals 2016. In other words, since every root is used once, we only needed to remove 2016 roots and we can't remove any less than 2016 roots because if we remove any less, there would have to be by pigeonhole some root that both sides share. And at that root, um, the resulting equation has the real solution, which is just plugging in that root. So therefore, k is precisely 2016, can't be any less, and 2016 does indeed work. So the answer is 2016, and we're done. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this problem and the process of solving. Um, this is definitely a fun one for me, uh, funner than some of the other questions on this short list, including that weird functional equation. But anyways, uh, see you guys another day.